are pretty on Ulysses. There it is. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with a review of the 2008 Chinese novel by Ma Jian, Beijing Coma, translated from the Chinese by his life partner, his wife, and his translator, Flora Drew. The original publication was 2008 in English, Chinese publication in 2009 in Hong Kong and Taiwan. Oh my god, this was an incredible five-star read. It's big. It's 666 pages and incredibly engrossing. It may be a bit too long for some of yous out there, but I thought it was the perfect length for such a heart-rending, historically important, personally and culturally tragic story about living in an authoritarian regime. The events of this novel center on the Tiananmen Square student protests culminating in the massacre in 1989. First, a little bit about Ma Jian. He has been living in exile since, I think, 1987, two years before the, the Tiananmen Square massacre. He was a published writer in China, but increasingly censored by the government before he went into exile. And in fact, some of the books that he's written are about being internally exiled, where he he went on self-imposed exile within China. This is the only book I've read by him, and I want to read all the others. Outspoken critic of the Chinese government in exile in London, and his fiery anti-authoritarian streak serves him well in the pages of this novel. The protagonist is Dai Wei, and he is a young university student in Beijing whose family background mirrors the horrors of 20th century Chinese history. I'm going to give details. It's not spoilers. It's This information comes out in the early chapters of the book. And it's quite horrifying, and I'm going to tell you some of the details. So just be warned that it's, this is true stuff. I mean, these are fictional characters, but this kind of stuff did happen in China to millions of people. His grandfather was declared a rightist because he owned two fields and three cows. And the new communist regime forced one of his sons, not our protagonist's father, but an uncle, to bury his own father alive or to be executed if he refused. So he buried his father, killed his father by burying him alive because the, he was a rightist. Dai Wei's father was a violinist and he had visited America and was very open to the liberal freedoms of the West, but he too was condemned as a rightist and he spent 22 years in hard labor camps. He would have like a, the occasional weekend pass, but he was lived apart from the family for a couple decades. And that, of course, broke him. I will leave it at that. There are stories that are far more grotesque that are narrated here, and um, I didn't enjoy reading them, but they were important to know. I had some of those horrors I had read about before, but the, it's all here. But the premise of the book is that Dai Wei is shot in the head as he is leaving, along with all of his fellow student protesters, leaving Tiananmen Square on June 4th, 1989. He's shot in the head and goes into a coma. He doesn't die, but he's in a coma, and he is at at least a certain stage after a couple of years of the coma. He wakes up without being able to communicate, so he is, it's like a waking coma. And so he is the narrator, lying paralyzed in the bedroom in his mother's rundown apartment in central Beijing, hearing all of her conversations and telephone conversations and the people that come over, but unable to blink or talk or interact, but fully cognizant of what's going on around him. Meanwhile, he, he descends deep, deep, deep into his memories, memories of his childhood, and especially memories of the... Tiananmen Square protests, which are relayed here in granular detail. Probably there would be quite a few readers that would agree with the famed New York Times critic Michiko Kakutani, who said this was a fantastic book that was in serious need of editing. I hung on every word, 
yes, it probably would have been just as good of a book if it had been maybe 200 pages shorter, 466 pages, but I don't think I loved it any less by having all those extra moments chronicled right down to what somebody smelled like and what this person was eating and so on. I, I thought it was all absolutely fascinating. So Dai Wei is reliving the moment-by-moment -moment detail of those many weeks of the student protests leading up to when he is shot. Also, his memory is taken farther back to his childhood and the family history that I've alluded to. So the narrative goes back and forth between what's happening in Tiananmen Square to what's happening two, five, seven, nine years later where the unconscious Dai Wei is aware of what his mother's talking about and who's in the room and there's a quite an incredible number of things that happen when he is paralyzed and comatose and his mother, his poor mother, is doing her best to take care of him. Lasting 10 years passed when he's shot. There are short italicized passages, some of which seem to be a more spiritual Dai Wei talking to himself that has an element of mythological, spiritual all-knowingness. If those had been long passages, I would have been bored to tears, but they were like a couple sentences here and there sprinkled through the text. And then there are others that seem to be excerpts from or a gesturing towards Dai Wei's favorite Chinese book, which is The Classic of Mountains and Seas. Uh, he calls it the Book of Mountains and Seas, but it's, it's the same book. So this is a classic Chinese text from perhaps the 4th century BC that is like a mythological atlas of China. So all kinds of Chinese mythology and chronicles of an ancient Chinese emperor, Great Yu. In Dai Wei's pre Tiananmen Square life, he had a couple girlfriends, uh, one of whom is his girlfriend right up until being shot. And he fantasizes and shares his dreams with these two girlfriends, both of whom he loves very deeply, about traveling around China and visiting the places that are referred to in this mythological ancient chronicle slash atlas, the Book of Mountains and Seas. So um, we get very, again, very brief italicized excerpts from that, or I'm not sure if they're excerpts or summaries of the various mythological beings animal, human, and otherwise, from that classic text. I thought it worked beautifully. I thought it was incredibly powerful. I loved being immersed in the moment-by-moment -moment play that is fictionalized, but it's, it reads as being very true. If anything that I googled, other than the names of Dai Wei, who's a fictional creation, and I, I think most of his friends in the story were fictional creations, but anybody else and any incident with what the government did, what the police did, the blah, 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 it's all true. And it's vivid, moves at a snail's pace, and the w waves of anxiety and strategizing and backbiting and infighting, it's all there, and it serves to achieve such a deep sense of these these young kids they were they just kind of stumbled into Dai Wei wasn't all that political he came from a family that had been persecuted through the generations for anything that remotely smacked of politics he had gotten into trouble with the police as a very young guy for making out with a young girl in a back alley or something like he just he was not a political being but he as he studied and got connected with more politically minded students it just kind of happened organically and they didn't they were all flying by the seat of their pants they didn't know what they were doing they were just ordinary people in extraordinary times and that comes through all of the mishaps the mistakes the egotism and the sense of how incredibly important this was I thought it was a tour de force. Everybody 
who is mildly conscious and has watched the news once or twice in the last few decades knows what happened at Tiananmen Square. It did not end well. The protest was brutally, violently, murderously crushed. So it's kind of like reading a novel about set on the Titanic. I mean, you know how the story is going to end. So to me, it was such a feat of literary uh, achievement that Majian could make me care even more about what was happening and to attach me that deeply to fictional characters so that I experienced the tragedy and uh, everything that happened at the end and then everything that happened to Dai Wei in, in a coma for a decade and his friends who had been fellow protesters and what their lives were like and his poor, downtrodden, screwed up, poor mother. This is what fiction is for. When fiction works, this is what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to make me feel something and understand something, in this case, that's uh, of, from recent history and care about it more. And Beijing Coma accomplished that uh, in spades. I'd just like to close with a little bit of a longer section. I want to give you a taste of the Tiananmen Square moment by moment and Dai Wei as a sentient comatose person in his mother's apartment years later, and those short italicized passages. So I found one where there aren't so many difficult to pronounce words that gives you a little bit of a taste of each of those. Let's dive in, shall we? We begin during the Tiananmen Square sequence, narrated by Dai Wei. His girlfriend at the time is somebody who also had a political awakening because of the Tiananmen Square protests, Tian Yi. I looked beyond their tent to Tiananmen Gate, where Chairman Mao's huge face was gazing down on the crowds, then south to the mausoleum where his embalmed remains were housed. The sight of that gray concrete building sickened me. I wished the students would storm inside, drag Mao's corpse out, and fling it over the walls of Zongnanhai. The two immense sculptures of revolutionary peasants and workers that flanked the mausoleum were dotted with students. They perched like spiders on the marble shoulders, legs and outstretched arms. A few were even sitting on the heads, making the statues look like mythical creatures from the Book of Mountains and Seas. Let's go and have something to eat, I said. I'll never be able to squeeze through that crowd, Tian Yi said. She was wearing a necklace of colored glass beads she'd bought in Yunnan. Walk behind me. I've got trainers on, so I can easily barge my way through. The restless, sweaty bodies below us suddenly resembled maggots wriggling over a lump of meat. We descended to the lower terrace and slowly pushed our way into the tightly packed crowd. It was almost impenetrable. When someone in front of us wanted to go to the toilet or look for a friend, a tiny crack would open and we could follow behind them for a while. The people lining these narrow pathways, which coursed through the square like veins, would instinctively raise a foot or shift their shoulders back to make way for us as we passed. If they happened to be sitting down, we had no choice but to climb over their heads. When someone shouted a new slogan, the crowd's focus would shift and a new path would open for a second before quickly closing again, like a wound healing over. But there was always a circle of space around anyone holding a Communist Party flag, a national flag, or a Communist Youth League banner. With great effort, we managed to climb over the metal railings that circled the base of the monument, squeeze our way over to the Museum of Chinese History, push through the crowds under the trees, and leave the square at its northeastern corner. By the time we finally disentangled ourselves from the throng, the biscuits in my bag were crushed to a pulp and my body felt like a broken abacus. Damn, my lens cap got pulled off, Tian Yi sighed, her hair in wild disarray. When the midday light slants onto your face, a smell of soap rises from your skin. You lie slumped inside your body, just as your body lies slumped on the iron bed. I hear a pigeon flapping away the air as it lands on a branch of the locust tree outside, and for a moment I see the world through its eyes. The red-tiled roof of the apartment building behind is covered with dust and fallen leaves. The locust tree is dark gray. When the sun comes out, residents nail washing lines to the trunk, tie them to their windows, and hang out their quilts to dry, 
making the tree resemble an open umbrella frame festooned with damp cloths. When it rains, the tree's bark turns black and the leaves appear greener and paler. The tree is almost as tall as our building. At night, whether lights were shining in the windows or a power cut had plunged the compound into darkness, I always felt safe when standing beneath its branches. My hearing has become very acute after these years of living in the dark. I can distinguish the different noises from every flat in this building. The sounds are especially clear in the hour before dawn. It's the afternoon now, and I can hear the yelping lapdog a neighbor bought last week, and the clucking hen downstairs that will soon become chicken soup. In her flat on the ground floor, Granny Pang is saying, That boy Daiwei hasn't got much longer to live. There was blood in his urine a couple of days ago. He's not really in a coma, he's just pretending, her daughter replies, pushing down on a creaking door handle. But he's ruined the feng shui of our block. The man in the flat next door says, She's lucky to have her son to sing to. No one else would put up with all that shrieking. He can't stand my mother singing, and I can't stand his son flinging objects against the walls. The constant bashing makes me think of the layers of bricks of this building pressing down on each other. For a moment I leave my slumbering body and hover in the fusty air of the room. I see myself sprawled across the bed, not in pajamas now, but in a shirt and trousers. I can feel the belt's brass buckle press coldly against my navel. Then I see myself getting up and walking down the street. I run over and pat myself on the back. Having lost the battle, General Fu Yu drowned himself in a river. If he appears to you inside a house, the emperor will die. If you see him wandering through the wastes, a calamity will befall the entire empire. If that sounds good, you must, you absolutely must, check out Ma Jian's Beijing Coma. Thanks for watching.